This one congressional race could effectively decide the balance of power for the entire House of Representatives. Case in point. Last week, Republicans tried and failed to impeach President Biden's Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Now, I should say for the record that Secretary Mayorkas has not actually done anything wrong. Certainly nothing illegal or impeachable, but Republicans in the House wanted to impeach him anyway. Their goal was to make a big public spectacle over the border that they could then use to blame President Biden even though Republicans are actually the ones holding up the immigration legislation aimed at addressing what is happening at the border. And that vote, that impeachment vote last week, failed. Republicans needed a simple majority, but the vote was split evenly, 215 to 215. It was such a close race. It was such a close vote that Republicans in the House went as far as to claim there was a Democratic plot a conspiracy to hide Democratic members from Republicans so that the Republican whip count would be incorrect. They hid one of their members uh, waiting to the last minute, uh, watching to see our votes, um, trying to throw us off on the numbers that we had versus the numbers they had. So, yeah, that was a strategy at play tonight. The actual story of that failed impeachment vote, the non-Marjorie Taylor Greene conspiracy version of events is that Texas Democratic Congressman Al Green was in the hospital. He was recovering from emergency abdominal surgery. But because the vote was important to him, Congressman Green took an Uber to the Capitol. He went to the attending physician's office to make sure his blood pressure and his temperature were still stable. And then Congressman Green voted from a wheelchair in his blue hospital garb. That is how thin the margins are in the House of Representatives. Al Green's dramatic hospital exit was the difference maker. Republicans right now can only afford to lose three votes. And as you may have noticed, the Republican conference does not always march in lockstep. The party needs every vote it can get. That is how much the special election in New York tonight matters. After that tied impeachment vote, the now former congressman from New York's 3rd District, George Santos, tweeted simply, miss me yet? So the stakes of this one congressional race are national. Now, tonight, Republicans once again voted to impeach Department of Sec Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. And this time, they prevailed by one single vote, 214 to 213, with three Republican defections. Articles of impeachment have been sent to the Senate, where there may be a possible trial. That makes Secretary Mayorkas, who again did nothing impeachable here, it makes him the first cabinet secretary impeached since the year 1876. And the reason Republicans had enough votes tonight, when just last week they did not, is because Republican House Majority Leader Steve Scalise is back on the Hill after taking a month-long absence for cancer treatment. That is how narrowly divided the House is at this moment. Every vote counts so much that major congressional decisions are being decided by medical absences. One week from today, next Tuesday, 4 p.m. Eastern, on the dot. That is the deadline Chief Justice John Roberts gave special counsel Jack Smith today to respond to Donald Trump's latest bid for immunity. Yesterday, Trump filed an emergency application challenging a federal appeals court ruling which said he was not immune from criminal prosecution. Trump's request now to the Supreme Court is to effectively freeze his federal election interference criminal trial. His lawyers argue the special counsel seeks urgently to force President Trump into a months-long criminal trial at the height of campaign season, effectively sidelining him and preventing him from campaigning against the current president, to whom the special counsel ultimately reports President Biden. Joining me now is the brilliant Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. Barb, thank you for being here. I am not a lawyer, as I say frequently, but the Supreme Court giving Jack Smith a week to respond to all of this seems like the court is not moving so efficiently, shall we say. Am I wrong here in thinking that? 
No, I, I had the same reaction, Alex. It does not suggest uh, that they're acting with a lot of urgency. But, of course, Jack Smith could file his response before a week goes by. In fact, if they're not working on it right now, as you and I are speaking, they're doing it wrong. They've known this was coming. They knew Donald Trump would be filing uh, his request by Monday. And so I, I have to think that they are crossing the T's and dotting the I's at this moment and will likely beat that deadline by quite a bit. Do you um, so what do you make of assuming Jack Smith files the before the deadline of the 20th? What do you expect in terms of indications for how the Trump how the Trump how this how the court is thinking of Trump's appeal here? You know, it's difficult to say because they can go in a lot of different directions. Uh, the the thing that he, they could do that would, I think, give us the best sense is to simply deny the stay, uh, treat it as a petition for uh, certiorari review, and say we're going to let the lower court decision stand. That would be a very loud uh, response to what they think of it, and case is over. On the other hand, they could decide they want to grant the stay, they're going to let Donald Trump even take the case to the en banc, the full court of the Court of Appeals below, and then before the U.S. Supreme Court. That would be the other extreme, which would suggest that this is on a very slow boat. Uh, and in that case, I can't imagine the, the uh, trial occurring before the election. What's more likely, though, Alex, is somewhere in between that they do decide to take it up, but they do it do so on a more expedited basis. And if they do that, I think a decision could be made within a month or two and get this case back on track for trial by summertime. Can we talk a little bit about that, though? If they take a month or two to effectively unfreeze the case, to put it in layman's terms, I mean, A, what's your expectation about the Alvin Bragg case, which is kind of on hold as the feds work out the timetable for their criminal inter election interference case? And then B, I mean, are, is the Supreme Court going to really consider the implications of, as Trump's lawyers point out, having a federal election interference case in the middle of a campaign? So in terms of coordinating the other cases, I think it'll actually work out just fine. Uh, you know, we've got this hearing in New York on Thursday, so we'll know more about the trial there. But March 25th appears to be the trial date for the New York hush money case. That trial won't, won't last more than a couple of weeks, and so that one will be long over. And so I think that puts the federal election interference case on track for a trial to start early summer, maybe around June 1st. And then with regard to your other question about whether this is a legitimate argument that the president... Uh, a, a, camp, a candidate for president needs to be campaigning, all defendants would have that argument. Everybody has a job. Everybody has important things to do. And so uh, I don't think that that should interfere. I think a trial, it gets set by a court in its own pace. And the idea that I have more important things to do just is not part of the consideration that this court should be looking at. Um, so we're going to have more intel on the Alvin Bragg case, as you point out, hearing on Thursday. Judge Angoron is also supposed to rule in uh, A.G. James' uh, civil fraud case. Do you have any expectation there, given the combativeness between the judge and Trump's defense team in the last week? I don't. I, I don't know. You know, there has been this reporting about uh, the judge asking for additional information about a perjury charge with um, Alan Weisselberg. And so that has delayed his his decision here. Um, you know, difficult to know how things are going to come out. But in light of the summary judgment uh, decision that Judge Engoron issued, it seems to me very likely that he will find a verdict in favor of the attorney general and that we'll see some big numbers. Big numbers due by Friday. Barbara McQuaid, our our expert. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Barb. Really appreciate it. If you are a Republican candidate for Senate, this, what we're about to show you, is not the kind of reception you want to get from members of your own party. That was Arizona Senate candidate and prominent election denier Republican Carrie Lake getting loudly booed by members of her own party at the Arizona GOP's annual convention last month. Carrie Lake is not what you might call a unifying figure even inside the Republican Party. But in October, she was endorsed by Donald Trump, which means that the rest of the Republican Party now has to fall in line behind Carrie Lake. And so today, Ms. Lake was officially endorsed by the National Republican Party's Senate campaign arm. This is just the latest sign that the National Republican Party now appears to exist for the sole purpose of carrying out Donald Trump's bidding. 
Just this week, Trump endorsed another election denier, Michael Watley, to replace Ronna McDaniel, who is the current head of the Republican National Committee. Trump also endorsed his own daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, to be the RNC new co-chair, which would make her a top deputy of the party chair. Trump says that this endorsement is about helping to ensure fair and transparent elections across the country. It is a move that is also very much the type of thing you see in authoritarian dictatorships. Joining me now is former RNC chair and co-host of The Weekend on MSNBC, Michael Still Steele. And still with me, of course, is Claire McCaskill. Michael, um, which is worse, the election denier or the nepotism? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think what we try to do on the Republican side is a little bit of both. You know, <laughs> just it's you know, it's like a good martini. It's, it's you know, gotta have it dry with an olive. You know, the twist, whatever. You kind of mix it up, right? That's the thinking here. You know, you've got you've got Watley from North Carolina who has been a, a Trump uh, uh, sycophant for a long time. You now have Trump's daughter-in-law coming in and taking over as co-chair, or presumably that's the way that vote will go. And then, of course, you know, Trump wants to put one of his guys in as sort of the the day-to-day -day, uh, overseer of the Republican National Committee. Let's not lose sight of what this is all about. This is not about fair and, and open and safe elections. This is about grift. This is about the diversion of RNC funds during the rest of this uh, presidential cycle to pay for Trump's legal bills. It, it happened when he was president. It had happened since he's been president, and it will continue to happen going forward. Now they have greater control over how that money is going to be raised, how that money is going to be spent. You don't think his daughter-in-law is going to make sure her father-in-law is taken care of? Of course not. So the reality of it is the party has now said, Donald Trump, it's all yours. Whatever aspect of it, whatever feature of it you want, you got. We've got the Senate lined up. We've got the House lined up. We've got the party apparatus lined up. So this is now fully, full on the MAGA party. Any remnants of Reagan, uh, Bush, Eisenhower, gone. Um, Claire, the cynic in me says, okay, it's a MAGA party. If they're going to try and win, maybe that's what they think they have to do. And yet, history shows us that Donald Trump is terrible at picking winners. I think the last time the RNC let Donald Trump handpick officials, almost all of his picks ended up pleading, is it guilty to federal crimes or being credibly accused of sexual assault? To say nothing of his Senate picks, I think, remember Blake Masters, in Arizona, Herschel Walker in Georgia, Mehmet Oz in Pennsylvania. I mean, this guy has whatever the opposite of a Midas touches when it comes to elections. Well, make no mistake, the Republicans in the Senate are trying hard to keep that mistake from not repeating. And the way they've done that is they they made Steve Daines chair of the Republican Senate committee. He went down to Mar-a-Lago, kissed the ring, said, I'm all for you, Trump. I'm going to be loyal to you. Will you work with us? And so they have really tried to keep Trump from going out on his own and endorsing these really big MAGA candidates. I mean, look at Montana. Trump endorsed mm -hmm. the guy that Mitch McConnell wants in Montana, Rosendale, just filed, who is a MAGA loyalist from the House. They're going to have a knockdown, drag out Republican primary for the Senate in Montana. But Trump is not on the MAGA side of that equation this time. So McConnell has really tried to outmaneuver him by trying to force him into the lane of what they believe are stronger candidates. Now, I'll just tell you this. I watched that video of Carrie <laughs> Lake at that Republican convention. And having spoken at many of my party's conventions in my state, all I can say is yikes. I mean, if I walked into the room of the people that are the most active in my party and was greeted with that kind of booing, I mean, it would be a brutal reality. So I think they got trouble in Arizona no matter what Trump does. Well, yeah, Michael, I mean, to Claire's point, is it horse trading? You get Mitch McConnell's Montana Senate candidate, but then you have to give him a, a mulligan, I guess, to use the golf well, term in Arizona with yeah. Carrie Lake. 
Well, look, I mean, take both of those races. I mean, the reality of it is, in each of those instances, MAGA is going to control who becomes the next uh, nominee. So, yeah, uh, McConnell may have boxed, uh, you know, D Trump into endorsing uh, his candidate. Doesn't mean, one, that Donald Trump won't change his mind and unendorse that endorsement, right, and move on away from it. But you still have the base is the part that votes. And so it doesn't matter in the main whether McConnell wins that endorsement battle or Trump does. Trump knows that at the end of the day, he's going to have his vote turn out for the candidate that is closest to him, because that's who they want. So yeah, the booing was not MAGA booing Kerry. Those were traditional Arizona Republicans who are frustrated by what has become of their party, not a reflection of necessarily of where the party is going to end up. She got the endorsement of the senatorial committee. What more does that tell you? So the booing really didn't matter much, did it? Because it's already baked in where this is going to go. MAGA controls the outcome of elections, the primary elections in the Republican Party. And that is a reality. And what's going to be interesting to watch is in a state like Maryland now that Larry Hogan has jumped into this U.S. Senate race there, the dynamics on the ground there have changed and could be a lesson for the party going forward because he now has so much changed the dynamics that he potentially levels up the game for Republicans in the state to win that seat. Not the MAGA Republicans. He's running independent of them. And that's going to be an important uh, race to watch in that regard as well. Do you still get to call yourself a Republican if you're not a MAGA Republican? Just asking. Michael just, Steele just asking. and Claire McCaskill, thank you both, my friends, for your time tonight. I appreciate it.